Welcome to Moments in the Museum. My name is David Smith and I work in the archive at Highgate School. The object I would like to talk about is a copy of a scientific paper that was co-authored by Professor John Ellis. John Ellis is an internationally renowned theoretical physicist who has made fundamental contributions to the theory and phenomenology of elementary particle physics. Phenomenology in this context means making quantitative predictions based upon known theories. He was born in Hampstead in 1946 and came to Highgate School in 1958. He boarded in Cordell House on Broadlands Road, supervised initially by Colonel Field and subsequently by Norris Butcher. He describes maths teacher Bertie Bellis and physics teacher Philip Bateman as having been significant influences. Bellis had founded the Mathematics Education Innovation or MEI project in the 1960s and went on to be headmaster of the Lee School in Cambridge following a spell in Scotland. The photograph of Bateman shows him running a science lesson in 1940 at Twoser's garage in Westwood Ho in Devon to where the majority of the school had been evacuated during the war. In 1963, John joined the committee of the School Astronomical Society, which had been created a couple of years earlier. Activities included a trip to the American Embassy to see a film of the three historic orbits of the Earth made by John Glenn, and a visit from Patrick Moore, who presented The Sky at Night on BBC television for over 50 years. The Society possessed a six-inch refractor telescope that was kept on the science block roof in a hut kindly loaned by the art master Cuffin Williams. According to the Chumlian, the school magazine, members found J. R. Ellis's American Geological Survey moon maps particularly interesting. In 1964, John Ellis was awarded an exhibition to King's College Cambridge to read mathematics. You should be able to spot another well-known name on the panel from the world of music. After graduating, he stayed on to tackle a PhD in theoretical high-energy physics in the Department of Applied Maths and Theoretical Physics, then housed on Silver Street. Along the way, he was the recipient of a Mayhew Prize that is granted annually to the student showing the greatest distinction in applied mathematics. The astronomer Fred Hoyle, famous for being the first to use the phrase Big Bang to describe the origin of the universe in a 1949 radio interview, had been a previous winner in 1935. After completing his PhD in 1971, John spent a year at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center near San Francisco as a research associate. SLAC was a straight two mile long machine constructed about 30 feet underground in the 1960s. It accelerated beams of electrons to almost the speed of light before crashing them into fixed targets. Experiments at the accelerator resulted in the award of three Nobel Prizes before it was shut down in 2000. He then moved south to the California Institute of Technology, or Caltech, in Pasadena near Los Angeles, where he was a Richard Chase Tolman research fellow. Tolman had been an American mathematical physicist and physical chemist who made contributions to statistical mechanics as well as to theoretical cosmology in the years following Einstein's discovery of general relativity. In 1973, John Ellis took up a post as a research fellow at the European Council for Nuclear Research, or CERN, in Geneva. He became a member of the CERN staff the following year, and in 1978 secured an indefinite contract. CERN was a joint venture set up in 1954 by 12 Western European countries. The laboratory was originally devoted to the study of atomic nuclei, but soon became concerned mainly with the study of interactions between subatomic particles using increasingly powerful particle accelerators. More and more energy is needed to create new, often very short-lived particles, according to Einstein's famous formula E equals mc squared. The proton synchrotron was started up in 1959 to smash protons into fixed targets at an energy of 28 giga electron volts, or GeV. By 1971, counter-rotating beams of protons were making head-on collisions with each other in the intersecting storage rings. An energy of 400 GeV was achieved by the 7 km in circumference super proton synchrotron in 1976, and by 1989 electrons were annihilating with their antiparticles in a large electron-positron collider housed in a circular 27 km tunnel, roughly 100 metres underground. 
The LEP was switched off in 2000 so that the Large Hadron Collider could be installed in its place. Eight years later, the LHC was turned on, enabling protons travelling in opposite directions in separate beam pipes to collide with each other at several points around the ring at energies of terra electron volts. Today, CERN is a truly international organisation with 23 member states. The 1976 paper that is on display in the museum describes a possible practical method of detecting subatomic particles called gluons. John had kindly donated a copy of the paper to the school, with a dedication, on the 40th anniversary of their eventual discovery. Particle physics began in the last decade of the 19th century, when J.J. Thomson discovered the electron at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. Ernest Rutherford demonstrated the existence of a positively charged nucleus inside atoms in 1911, and the identification of the neutron by James Chadwick in 1932 established that all matter consisted of protons, neutrons and electrons. But in the same year, a positive electron, the positron, was discovered. And four years later, the muon, similar to an electron but some 200 times heavier, turned up in cosmic rays. Over the next few decades, as ever more powerful particle accelerators were constructed, a zoo of new, very short-lived particles came to light. In the 1960s, the organisation of heavy particles called hadrons into groups according to an eightfold way led to a proposition that they in turn consisted of smaller entities called quarks, a name coined by Murray Gell-Mann from a phrase used in James Joyce's 1939 book Finnegan's Wake. A proton, for example, consists of two up quarks and one down quark. The forces between fundamental particles are explained by a constant exchange of other particles between them. Atoms are held together by the electromagnetic force, for example, in which virtual photons are tossed backwards and forwards between the positive protons in the nucleus and the surrounding negative electrons. It had been postulated that the strong force that overcomes the repulsion between protons in a nucleus was mediated by an interchange of particles called gluons between their constituent quarks. But these had not been detected by the mid-1970s. In an article in CERN Courier, the monthly magazine published by CERN, to mark the 30th anniversary of the discovery of the gluon in 2009, Ellis wrote, this was the context in 1976 when I was walking back over the bridge from the CERN cafeteria to my office one day. As I turned the corner by the library, it occurred to me that the simplest experimental situation to search directly for the gluon would be through production via Bremsstrahlung, or radiation, in electron-positron annihilation. My theoretical friends, Graham Ross, Mary Guilard and I, then proceeded to calculate the gluon bremsstrahlung process in quantum chromodynamics, demonstrating how it would manifest itself in the appearance of three jet events featuring the long-sought smoking gluon. Mary Guilard, a professor at Berkeley in California since 1981, had been the first person to address gender imbalance at CERN the year before on International Women's Day. Her 2015 book, a singularly unfeminine profession, one woman's journey in physics, described the alienation of and discrimination against women making physics their livelihoods in the 1960s and 70s. Graham Ross was a winner of the Institute of Physics Dirac Medal in 2012 and is now an Emeritus Fellow of Wadham College, Oxford. What uh, John Ellis and Mary Key Gaillard and I did was to realize that you could look for the gluon in an analogous way to the way quarks had been looked for by studying the jet of particles they turn into. When the paper, which is very mathematical in nature, was written, two jets of hadrons had recently been observed emerging from collisions between electrons and positrons. The virtual photon that is produced in the annihilation creates a quark-antiquark -quark pair each of which ends up generating beams of quark containing hadrons. John Ellis and co. predicted that, at higher collision energies, one of the quarks created from the virtual photon might radiate a gluon, which would in turn generate a third jet of hadrons. During the second half of 1978 and the first half of 1979, the team at DZ, the German electron synchrotron in Hamburg, 
was systematically increasing the collision energy of Petra, the positron-electron tandem ring facility, up to the range where three jet events due to gluon Bremsstrahlung were expected to be detectable. The first three jet news came in June, and the public announcement of the discovery was made at Fermilab near Chicago in August, by which time all three particle detectors around the Petra ring, Tasso, Jade and Pluto, had presented evidence of three jet events. The current standard model of particle physics contains 17 particles, six quarks, which make up protons and neutrons, amongst other things, six leptons, including the electron, four force carriers, including the gluon, and the infamous Higgs boson, which is responsible for generating mass. The Institute of Physics awarded John Ellis its Maxwell Medal for exceptional early career contributions to theoretical physics in 1982, and its Dirac Medal for his highly influential work on particle physics phenomenology, in particular on the properties of gluons, the Higgs boson and the top quark, in 2005. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Society of London in 1985 and was appointed a CBE in 2012 for services to science and technology. He left CERN, where he had served as leader of the theory division between 1988 and 1994, and took up a post as Clark Maxwell Professor of Theoretical Physics at King's College London in 2011. He continues to be very active in research, some of which is concerned with the next generation of particle accelerators post Large Hadron Collider, and some of which relates to physics beyond the standard model. John has given numerous public lectures over the years, including one at Highgate in the summer of 2009. His talk began with an image of a painting dating from 1898 by Paul Gauguin, a print of which he used to adorn his office wall when he was a graduate student. Its title, Where Do We Come From? What Are We? Where Are We Going? supposedly reminded him why he came to work every day. He was wearing a t-shirt bearing an ultra-short version of the so-called Lagrangian, in which the mathematics of the standard model is encoded into four compact equations. Thank you for watching. I do hope that you might be able to visit the School Museum to see John Ellis's 1976 paper for yourselves. Thank you.